started in 2008, the Wola Duke Human Rights Book Award is a joint venture of Duke University and the Washington Office on Latin America. WOLA is the leading U.S. human rights organization promoting human rights, social justice, and democracy in Latin America. The award honors the best current nonfiction book published in English on human rights, democracy, and social justice in contemporary Latin America. It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Robin Kirk, Program Director for the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, who will introduce Hector Abad. Um, and my connection to, to Colombia, um, from 1992 until 2004, I worked for Human Rights Watch and covered Colombia as one of my countries, and uh, traveled uh, extensively throughout the country, um, including to Antioquia and, um, and to Medellin. Um, I never met your dad. Um, but I did meet a number of his colleagues and friends um, in the course of my work um, covering human rights at that very difficult uh, time. And uh, I um, very much remember all the stories that people like Jesus Valle told me about your dad and about the tremendous um, influence he had on so many people's lives. Um, I was very fortunate in my work to meet a number of people who were great inspirations, um, including, um, as I mentioned, Jesus Valle, who took over in, in many ways the Medellin Human Rights Committee, as well as um, people like uh, um, Josue Giraldo, who was a human rights leader from um, the city of Villavicencio in, in Meta. Um, when I first went to Medellin, I expected to find, you know, this violence-torn, uh, scary um, sort of hellhole. And what I was amazed to learn about that place and, uh, was what an incredible um, creative place it was uh, in terms of writing and poetry and culture. And I think that's what you read in the first part of Oblivion is the tremendous um, achievement uh, of, uh, of, par of part of Medellin that so many people really are not familiar with, and that's certainly what I uh, also experienced along with um, <coughs> the tremendous political conflict that was going on at that time and in many ways still continues. And I think for myself as a human rights researcher and writer, um, I always struggled with um, these two sides, the, the dark and the light, the violence, and also, the, the, but the tremendous um, ingenuity and creativity and fun um, and life that you saw throughout Colombia and, and in particular in places like Medellin. Um, and I think that's, uh, to some degree, what you also read in Oblivion is the tremendous vitality of this place um, that really puts the lie to this image that's broadcast uh, throughout the world of, of violence and conflict. Um, thank you. I, I suppose some of you prefer broken English than Spanish, so I will try to, to speak in English and to read this speech in English. I, I began hearing English with a gringo bueno who came to my house <laughs> when I was a child, Mr. Richard Saunders, who was a, a good sociologist. I don't know exactly from where, but he was working in a program uh, that was called Future for the Children, and he found my father, and my father was helping him to go to the poorest barrios near Medellin and the poorest towns near Medellin, and they worked together for, for clean water and things like that, that my father loved. And I was fascinated by this English words, but I never uh, learned it good because it's such a different and difficult language. Vowels are difficult, and um, and you will see that during the reading it will be worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the two people of the jury, uh, Holly Ackerman 
and Robin Kirk, and thank you also for the introduction, and thank you for choosing my book. Um, my name is Hector Abad, and my father's name was Hector Abad. He was a great advocate for human rights. I am not, nor I have ever been. That's why I've, I have always used a line from Quevedo to define myself, and this line goes like, like this. Un cobarde con nombre de valiente. Or in English, a coward with the name of someone courageous. I know very well that I don't deserve this award and that it is being given posthumously to a man with my same name, my father. I accept the award with this fundamental clarification. The Walla Duke Book Award is not for the author of this book, but for its protagonist. So that, so that you understand, in fact, how much he does deserve this award, I want to begin by telling you, by telling you all a story from my adolescence that I forgot to tell in oblivion, but which seems important to share with you now. One day, in the middle of the 70s, the library in my house not such a beautiful library, a small library. The library in my house was suddenly invaded by a bunch of cardboard boxes. Inside the boxes were paper packages tied up with a string, and inside each of these packages were 100 identical pamphlets. My dad had printed, using his own funds, 5,000 little green booklets all with the same title and the same content, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These small skinny booklets reproduce this fundamental documentation of the world's moral progress. And from that day, my dad gave them away to visitors of the house, and whenever he could, he distributed them on streets of the city. The text was the same text approved by the United Nations in 1948, when after the carnage of the Second World War, 70 million dead, many were convinced that it was necessary to have some kind of lay 10 commandments of universal law that would bring together in a few rules the most basic principles of agreement in order to build a better world for all mankind, a world that would be more just and less oppressive and violent. When my father this did his silent and peaceful protests in the streets of Medellin, he would distribute these small booklets as someone might hand, might hand out some subversive revolutionary pamphlet. And in some sense, they were the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if taken seriously and applied rigorously, is a document that could destabilize many governments, many regimes, and many political, economic, and religious abuses in the world today. I want to clarify, nonetheless, that when I wrote the story about my father, my intent was very modest even personal and intimate. I didn't set out to write the biography of a, human right of a human rights defender, but instead I wanted to relate the family and public life of a good man. Initially, I did it, ju I did it with just one objective. Since my children hadn't gotten to know their murdered grandfather, I wanted them to get to know him at least through the memories that the, word, that the words evoke. Oblivion was written initially so that two adolescent readers, my children, would learn about the history of our family before their birth. In this book about oblivion, against oblivion, and in spite of oblivion, I wanted to tell them, my son and daughter, what the world, my world, had been like before they were born. 
I wanted them to understand why I am afraid of moles, of illness and of motorcycles driven by young men fresh from the barbers. Why I seem like a crazed fanatic when I talk about the difficulties in getting visa for first world countries like Spain or the United States. Why in our family stories there are dead people who have as much or more presence in our words than the living do. You will all have had this experience too. When a person gets ma married or starts seeing someone, there is a moment in the relationship that is, a la that is like a return to childhood. I don't mean by how infantile people become when they fall in love, but the stories the other person tells us about what their life was like before we, before we met them. Their other love affairs, their childhood, their parents and grandparents. And you will, you will have noticed that in this tale of the life of the person we are getting to know, there are some fundamental presences, beings who emerge strongly with a presence no matter how absent they may be. Presencias, presences. As the Colombian philosopher Fernando González explains, there are dead who conserve their presence. I was born one month after the death of the Archbishop of Medellín, Joaquín García, and he has always been present in my life and therefore in my books. I think probably with more force than if I had known him. And he has been present not only because of this lovely name I have been lumbered with, my real name is Hector Joaquin, but because since I have known myself, he has been kept alive in the heart and words of my mother and also in household miracles. How many checks and lost keys have reappeared, how many fevers and illnesses have been cured thanks, who, thanks to his blessed supernatural intercession. So anyway, what I wanted to do with this book, among many other things, was a very simple rescue operation of certain family figures, of some fundamental and unforgettable presences in my life. My sister, who died, and my mother and father. I wanted the two of them to, to also be present in the lives of my children. I wanted my son and daughter to know them. I created a private portrait of my family, just as painters have always done. During the Renaissance, for example, tired of painting kings, popes, cardinals and princes, some evenings at home they had painted a family portrait, a picture of their wife, their father, their mother-in-law or son. They did so lovingly, and maybe that's why they came out very well and their domestic paintings are still hanging on the walls of many museums all over the world. The almost living face of those family members still fighting against death and against oblivion. This was then my private reason for telling this story. Why then, if it is so private, did I publish it? Why turn one's own gratitude and resentment into a book? Why commit the immodesty of exhibiting one's own guts in public, or sh of showing one's stark love and red-hot rage? There is at least one motive. I'm fed up with being treated everywhere I go in the world for the simple fact of being Colombian, as a drug trafficker, as a terrorist, as a hitman, a paramilitary, a guerrilla, or a delinquent. That's not what I am. That's not what we all are. In Colombia, there has been and still is intolerable violence. But we ourselves have been the first to suffer from it. Colombia is terrible, but Colombia can also be magnificent. Medellin has been terrible, 
but Medellin is not the worst hole in the world. In the mafioso Pablo Escobar's Medellin, 500 police officers were murdered in the year 1991 and 7,000 other people. But in my friend, my mayor, Sergio Fajardo's Medellin, when his mandate came to an end in 2007, those 7,500 mothers have been reduced to 750. Improvement is possible. In this tragic book, I also want to say that progress is possible. Oblivion can be read in two ways. One is a bitter, angry reading, which I myself, perhaps, have committed the mistake of encouraging when I have said that it's a very sad story. But it can also be read radiantly, happily. In an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, middle-class family in Antioquia, there was a person full of love, a decent, honorable, good person. Lucky for me, we were, we were very close relatives. We are not the scum of, earth, of the earth. We have hope as a people and as a country because there is, in those sad tropics, in America's backyard, there can also be a person as complex, as complete, and as good as the protagonist of this book. My friend, Alberto Aguirre, who died two months ago, one of the people my book is dedicated to, wrote to me when it was first published, and I quote him. For me, it is not a sad book, much less a very sad book. Perhaps you were sad while you were writing it, but Oblivion, a memoir, excludes all sadness. When a man of such an integrity appears, and when the integral relationship that man has with other men, with other humans, is shown, what the spirit, what the spirit feel, feels is exultation, gratitude that on this earth a being of such quality and such strength existed. One feels justified as a human being. That's Alberto Aguirre, quote. Forgive me for quoting these phrases that praise the book, but I want you to interpret them as they should really be interpreted, that is, as praise of the protagonist, the namesake of mine, who was killed 25 years ago on Argentina, on Argentina Street in Medellin. And as those of you who have read the book already know, that man who was murdered carried two document, two documents in his pocket. One was a document of wickedness and brutality. The other was a document of beauty and intelligence. The first was a list with names of people that were to be killed. On that list was the name of my father. The other document was a poem attributed to Jorge Luis Borges, a sonnet that, which goes like this in Spanish. In Spanish. Eh, ya somos el olvido que seremos, el polvo elemental que nos ignora y que fue el rojo Adán y que es ahora todos los hombres y que no veremos. Ya somos en la tumba las dos fechas del principio y el término, la caja, la obscena corrupción y la mortaja, los ritos de la muerte y las endechas. No soy el insensato que se aferra al mágico sonido de su nombre. Pienso con esperanza en aquel hombre que no sabrá que fui sobre la tierra. Bajo el indiferente azul del cielo, esta meditación es un consuelo. You will find the translation in, in the English edition of the book. And it's a beautiful translation. By putting these two pieces of paper together, a thread and a poem about death, my father left us one last message. I know that they are probably going to kill me, but I face my death with serenity. Even if I am forgotten, it doesn't matter because I have done my duty and all of us are in some way going to die and be forgotten. In writing this book, I wanted that oblivion which we, we, which we will all become, 
to be postponed a little. I wanted my children and later other readers to know about the decent, beautiful life of a good man, both its private and its public aspects. By giving the award to this story, and above all to the, prota to the protagonist of this book, you are helping me ensure that his life, which was sacrificed to defend the human rights of us all, is remembered for some years more and in an area that is bigger and more important than just my own country. My father didn't leave me his bravery as an inheritance, but he did leave me his optimism. I believe that humanity can improve, and in fact, I believe that it has improved since the centuries of tortures, duels of honor, slavery, discrimination against women and, and homosexual, the burning of heretics and the hanging of the unfaithful, we have taken many steps forward. When we remember the fight of men like my father, who defended their causes even at the risk of their own lives, I believe that we are helping humanity continue on its path toward a world that is less unjust. Thank you all.